Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be, at the very least, making a start on my review of The Butleary and Jihad by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. So this is the Legends of Dune series, which I believe is another trilogy. I've recently read and reviewed um, the uh, Prelude to Dune trilogy um, and enjoyed that. This takes place a lot further back in time, so we're talking, and like none of the characters we know and love are going to be in these. Um, but we do still see a lot of the same houses, and the Butlerian Jihad itself is like the crusade against the thinking machines. It's basically uh, mankind versus AI and robots, which is something that I've always been kind of interested in. As always, I'm going to read you the blurb, then I'm going to go through and check out my legion of tabs, and I will share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So, Dane reads... In June, the Butler in Jihad, Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson bring to life the story of the war with the thinking machines that once enslaved humans. Witness how Serena Butler's passionate grief ignites a struggle that will liberate humans from their machine masters. Read the amazing tale of the Zen Sunny Wanderers who escape bondage to flee to the desert world where they will declare themselves the free men of June. Uh, I've only just realised the free men, that's where Fremen comes from. I did realise that the Zen Sunny Wanderers would later become the Fremen. But I've only just realised that's where Fremen itself as a term comes from. Anyway, let's go on straight away. So here I have two tabs. So um, all of the June books, all of the chapters start with quotes that are from like either characters or from like documents and stuff that are from within the world. So this is a quote from Sister Becca the Finite. When humans created a computer with the ability to collect information and learn from it, they signed the death warrant of mankind. And I thought that was interesting because we have created humans, uh, machines that can do that. Uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence. And I just think this line here is great, uh, the start of this. Salusa Secundus hung like a jeweled pendant in the desert of space, an oasis of resources and fertile fields, peaceful and pleasing to the optic sensors. Unfortunately, it was infested with feral humans. And we get this little line. There's a lot of, in these books, a lot of poking fun at politics, which actually holds true really well to our own reality as well. So we get this. Um, Quato Chiri, take a squadron and escort Viceroy Butler, his daughter, and all of the League representatives deep into the subterranean shelters. They should be heading there already, sir, the officer said. Xavier gave him a stiff smile. Do you trust politicians to do the smart thing first? Does anybody? So a quote here from Terse Rosavia Harkonnen addressed to Seleucid Militia. Any man who asks for greater authority does not deserve to have it. And a note here on the, the Harkonnens and the Atreides in this. They've almost swapped positions. So at the start of this book, it's almost as though the Harkonnens are the good guys and the Atreides are the bad guys. Um, it does change. Um, but it's just interesting. That's how far back in history we are. That like the typical roles of those two houses have almost been reversed. And um, this is one of the robots here, and I just think this is really interesting, like looking at the way the robots think. I'm intrigued by questions. Why do wealthy humans eat with such ceremony? Why do they consider certain foods and beverages superior to others when the nutritional value is the same? The robot's voice became more erudite. The answer, Omnius, has to do with their brutally short lives. They compensate with efficient sensory mechanisms capable of imparting intense feelings. Humans have five basic senses with countless gradations. The taste of Yonder beer versus Ulada wine, for example, or the feel of Ekaz burlap compared with Parasil, or the music of Brahms versus... I suppose that is all very interesting in some esoteric way. So a uh, quote here from St. Augustine, ancient earth philosopher. The mind commands the body and immediately obeys. The mind orders itself and meets resistance. As an anxiety sufferer, I can confirm that is true. And so Vor Atreides has taught uh, Metal Mind. I can't remember the actual robot's name. He just calls him uh, Metal Mind. Um, and um, Vor basically threatens sabotage with the ship without ever really intending to do so, concocting extraordinary, unpredictable emergencies. Do you consider it cheating on your part or on mine? The revelation astonished Vor. It saddens me to think that, even in jest, I have taught you deception. It makes me ashamed to be human. Well, that's what we do. We deceive. Uh, so then we get this guy called Selim who gets um, uh, banished from the Zen Sunny Wanderers. Um, and he kind of learns to tame the sandworms in the desert. Um, but one of them dies. He kind of accidentally rides it and he rides it to death. And then it dies and he goes in and takes one of the teeth, um, which is what they used to make Chris knives. But I was under the impression that as soon as the worms died, they kind of just disintegrated, leaving just their teeth behind. But this worm doesn't seem to disintegrate. But I might have got that wrong, or it might take some time for them to disintegrate. 
we get this great uh, little line between Serena Butler and Xavier Harkonnen. I think he's Harkonnen. Um, so they're kind of lovers. And uh, they have to, you know, duty calls and all that. And she says, when you return, I promise I will make it up to you. I'll give you a banquet of kisses. He allowed himself a rare laugh. Then I plan to arrive very hungry indeed. Excellent flirting, you two. Good stuff. I uh, just enjoyed uh, this little line here. I'm not religious, um, but I do find the golden mean quite interesting. Um, and God is like very much a kind of consistent concept throughout the June books. God is the mathematician of the universe. There is an ancient correlation known as the golden mean, a pleasing ratio of form and structure that is found in this leaf, in seashells, and in the living creatures of many planets. It is the tiniest part of the key known since the time of the Greeks and Egyptians of Earth. They used it in their architecture and pyramids, in their Pythagorean pentagram of Fibonacci sequence. She discarded the leaf, but there is so much more. Here we go, Surat, so he's the, uh, he's the robot, and um, him and Vor are having a bit of their banter. And um, Vor goes, you're too literal, that's why I beat you in so many strategy games. Only 43% of the time, young man, Surat corrected. He activated the exit ramp. Around half. Vorian headed towards the hatch, anxious to get outside and breathe fresh air. Not bad for someone susceptible to illnesses, distractions, physical weaknesses, and any number of other frailties. I'm gaining, I'm gaining ground on you too, if you care to examine trends. Not just machine learning that can learn. Mm. And this is kind of a word of warning to our own civilization about what can happen if we over rely on robots. Um, so Agamemnon hesitated, but did not voice any objections, wary of the watch eyes. When he visited Earth, Tlaloc realized how the human race had gone stagnant, how people had become so dependent on machines that they had nothing left but apathy. Their goals were gone, their drive, their passion. When they should have had nothing to do but unleash their creative impulses, they were too lazy to perform even the work of the imagination. And so um, Erasmus, uh, the robot, is trying to become, not, maybe, not necessarily to become more human, but to understand humans. He's trying to understand art. And he does this by basically ripping people apart and then painting their organs. So uh, we get, for once Erasmus did not debate with the overmind. Omnius was correct in his scepticism. Erasmus had not attained true creativity. Yes, he had produced an original and graphic arrangement, but in human artwork, the sum of the components added up to more than the individual items. Just ripping organs from victims, floating them in blood, and painting them brought him no closer to understanding human inspiration. Even if he manipulated the details, he remained imprecise and uninspired. So a quote here from Tlaloc from A Time for Titans. There is a certain hubris to science, a belief that the more we develop technology and the more we learn, the better our lives will be. And uh, Holtzman, who he creates the, um, the shields that, that, that they use in the battles. Um, and this is just true, again, of our own world. Early in his career, Holtzman had realized that it was not always the best scientists who received the accolades or funding. Instead, it was the best showman, the most effective, po the most effective politician. And that just made me think of like Nikolai Tesla. Uh, a quote from Anonymous. Opportunities are a tricky crop with tiny flowers that are difficult to see and even more difficult to harvest. Yep. Um, and then the robots take Gyedi Prime, um, which is the Harkonnen homeworld, in the later books anyway. Um, so we get this, bow to us, Barbarossa said. The Magnus laughed. You're mad, I would never. Agamemnon swung one of his sleek metal arms sideways. He had not fully tested this new body and was not aware of the magnitude of his strength. He had meant to strike the governor in the face, an instinctive angry slap. Instead, the arm delivered a blow so forceful that it ripped the man's torso in half. The two parts of his body thudded against the far wall in a splatter of gore. Oh well, my demand was a mere formality anyway. We gotta use the word teasingly, which drives me mad. Quote from Iblis Jinjo from Early Planning for the Jihad. Religion time and time again brings down empires, rotting them from within. And we kind of learn in this that the way they plan to take down um, the robots is through religion because they they know that nothing unites humanity as much as religion does especially in war one of the characters here this is just a line i agree with too often when she measured other people she found them wanting yeah other people suck don't rely on them never rely on them quote from tlaloc from a time for titans all men are not created equal and that is the root of social unrest and then here from Iblis jinjo early planning for the jihad whether we are rich, poor, strong, weak, intelligent, or stupid, the thinking machines treat us as nothing more than meat. They do not understand what humans really are. I mean, we are meat, but we're more than that as well, you know. Erasmus, laboratory notes. 
The psychology of the human animal is malleable, with his personality dependent upon the proximity of other members of the species and the pressures exerted by them. And uh, Erasmus is um, experimenting on humans. He wanted to see if he could force one of the twin girls to kill the other. It would be a landmark experiment, one that would reveal important insights into moral boundaries and how siblings defined them. Um, and then we get this. Finally, the squirming, dark-haired twins stood in front of him, held by the sentinel robots. He shifted his pliable face film into a casual smile. One of the girls spat on the reflective surface. Erasmus wondered why saliva carried such a negative connotation for humans. It caused no damage and could be cleaned off easily. The forms of human defiance never ceased to amaze him. And again, this just made me think of um, the Fremen, who we don't have yet, but the way they think about and treat water, they would consider that an honour. To spit in front of somebody is an honour showing that you're willing to sacrifice your body's water for them. And we get this as well, which is a great, uh, I mean, a fascinating little act of rebellion. Shortly before Erasmus had left his estate on Corinth, 22 slaves had removed their protective eye films and intentionally stared into the furious red giant sun, blinding themselves. Disobedient, resistant and stupid. What did the rebellious act accomplish other than rendering them useless for slave work? They had expected to be killed, and Erasmus would oblige them, but not so that they could become martyrs. Instead, he had quietly separated them from other workers to prevent the spread of their unruliness. Blinded, they could not find or earn food. By now, he supposed they must have starved in their self-inflicted darkness. Still, he had marvelled at their spirit, their collective will to challenge him. Even though humans were a troublesome breed, they were constantly fascinating. A quote from Juno from Lives of the Titans that I found relatable because I have a lot of death anxiety. The future. I hate it because I will not be there. A quote from Fundamental Postulate from Cogitors. The mind imposes an arbitrary framework called reality, which is quite independent of what the senses report. Um, okay, so the, one of the things that uh, is done here, I just think this is quite a clever way of testing loyalty, even though it's evil and devious. Um, surely some of my experiments intrigue you, Omnius, just a little. You know the answer to that. Erasmus said, yes, the experiment to test the loyalty of your human subjects is proceeding nicely. I have delivered cryptic messages to a handful of trustee candidates, I prefer not to reveal exactly how many, suggesting that they join the brewing rebellion against you. There is no brewing rebellion against me. Of course not. And if the trustees are completely loyal to you, they will never consider such a possibility. On the other hand, if they were genuinely faithful to your rule, then they would have reported my incendiary messages immediately. Therefore, I presume you have received reports from my test subjects? For a long moment, Omnius hesitated. I will recheck my records. Hmm, yes. Speaks for itself. This is part of uh, Zen Sunny Fire poetry from Arrakis. Thirsty men speak of water, not women. I mean, it depends how you define thirsty, doesn't it? Uh, from Notes in the Margin of a Stolen Notebook by Iblis Ginjo. Talk is based on the assumption that you can get somewhere if you keep putting one word after another. So here we get a little bit about the need for religion um, to kind of win this war, basically. Iblis struggled to comprehend, trying to stretch his thoughts. Love, hate, fear, is that what you mean? They are components, yes. Components of religion. The machines are very powerful and it will take more than a mere political or social uprising to defeat them. The people must coalesce around a powerful idea that goes even deeper, into the very essence of their existence, what it means to be human. You must be more than a trustee, but a visionary leader. Slaves need to rise up in a great holy war against the machines, an unstoppable jihad to overthrow their masters. Mm, the Butlerian jihad. We find out in this book why it is called that, although the fact that there's a character called Serena Butler should be a bit of a clue. Okay, a uh, quote from Erasmus, Reflections on Sentient Biologicals. Psychology, the science of inventing words for things that do not exist. And Serena says, you can keep improving yourself, Erasmus, but we human beings use only small portions of our brains. We have an enormous potential to develop new abilities. Your capacity for learning is no greater than ours. Actually, it's a myth that we only use like a small percentage of our brains. We do use all of our brains. We just use it all for different things. Um, this is a quote from Tia Holtzman's Coded Diary, Partially Destroyed. The god of science can be an unkind deity. And here's a quote from Primero Fake and Butler from Memoirs of the Jihad. Owing to the seductive nature of machines, we assume that technological advances are always improvements and always beneficial to humans. Yes, we do. And uh, the Holtzman shields are still being developed, and Norma, who's like this very gifted mathematician, daughter of a witch who doesn't like her because she's not a witch, but she is a mathematician. 
Um, and she says, if a projectile moves slowly enough, it can penetrate your shields. The shield will stop a fast bullet, but anything slower than a certain critical value passes through. What sort of enemy fires slow-moving bullets anyway, Holtzman said, pulling the papers back toward him. Are you afraid someone will be hurt by a tossed apple? Here we have a saying of ancient earth, it's not my problem. Good saying. And this is from uh, Bokvo Manresa, first viceroy of the League of Nobles. Is there an upper limit to the intelligence of machines and a lower limit to the stupidity of humans? In both cases, probably not. And here we have somebody being murdered by the robots essentially for spreading uh, malaise discontent. Without a sound or any sign of effort, Ajax pulled his artificial limbs in different directions, tearing the helpless Ohan asunder. The man's arms and legs ripped free, his chest tore open and the broken bones pierced skin. Blood and entrails spilled onto the clean flagstones of the Golden Age Square. And I just like that because that, I, I mean, I like a good gore passage. And uh, James Herbert, funnily enough, not, as opposed to Frank O'Brien, no relation, he was very good at writing those and it's one of the reasons why I like James Herbert's books. Here we have a quote from Kajito Echo of Earth. Whatever has form, human or machine, has mortality. It is only a matter of time. And a quote here from Vori and Atreides, turning points in history. The darkness of humanity's past threatens to eclipse the brightness of its future. A quote from Cogito Reticulus Millennial Observations. Science, under the guise of benefiting humankind, is a dangerous force that often tampers with natural processes without recognising the consequences. Under such a scenario, mass destruction is inevitable. A quote from Iblis Ginjo, note in the margin of a stolen notebook, bear in mind he's one of the kind of key players in the Butlerian Jihad. He says, is a religion real if it costs nothing and carries no risk? Imperial Ecological Survey of Arrakis from the Ancient Records, researcher uncredited. We are not like Moses. We cannot call forth water from stone. Not, an, not at an economical rate anyway. And I like this because, again, we're on Arrakis and uh, Naib Darth, he says, you may talk with each other, but it would be best to keep your conversation to a minimum. Wasted words are wasted moisture. Which again, I just really like the way that moisture is looked at on Arrakis. Another quote from Iblis Ginjo, options for total liberation. Life is a banquet of unexpected flavors. Sometimes you like the taste, sometimes you don't. Life is like a box of chocolates. And so here, and this is a mild spoiler, but I've got to share it. This is Serena Butler giving a speech. Um, and she goes, You have all seen the shrine to my son who was murdered by the thinking machines. Perhaps it is easier to comprehend the tragedy of a single victim than of billions. But that child only symbolizes the horrors ominous and the synchronized worlds wish to inflict upon us. She raised a clenched fist. We must declare a crusade against the machines, a holy war, a jihad, in the name of my murdered son, Mannion. It must be... Manion Butler's Jihad. Butlerian Jihad. And then there's a big battle towards the end and Vora Trades, um, he's changed sides. He's changed from working with the machines to working with the humans. And he's trying to stop an update ship from leaving because that has all the information on their attacks. Uh, and if the update ship gets away, then basically the robots can download all of this data and understand better what happened. And he hits this ship and cripples it and he goes, stand down and prepare to be boarded. The robot responded with surprising sarcasm. I am aware of the various bodily orifices humans possess. Therefore, I invite you to take a power tool and insert it where the... Old metal mine, Vor cried. Let me come aboard, it's Vori and Atreides. That cannot be true. Vori and Atreides would never fire upon me. Nevertheless, old metal mine, he did. So yeah, the Butlerian Jihad by June, it's a decent little kind of continuation of all of the prequels. Uh, I am quite interested in it just because I do like, as you can see from a lot of the quotes, I love this, just the, I guess... I like, I'm interested in artificial intelligence and machine learning and stuff in our own world. So I like to see how it's handled in fiction. And this is kind of, it's got some powerful warnings that we probably should bear in mind. Uh, overall, I didn't think it was as good as the um, the house, the house trilogy. I forgot, already forgot what it was called now. But um, it was still pretty good. First book in a trilogy. Uh, I'm looking forward to the machine crusade now. And uh, yeah, 3.5 out of 5, but a strong one. So there we have it, that's what I made of The Butler and Jihad by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.